Alright, so in this video I'm going to give an explanation more about my Talos Principle PC here. And this is probably going to get quite ranty if being warned I'm doing this one take. No cuts or anything. Um, but so the first thing, if you haven't seen the demo video, go watch that right now. It's only a minute 30, this video is probably like an hour long. Just go do it. <laughs> Um, but the next thing that you've probably already noticed is this is extremely laggy. You see in the corner I'm getting 200 millisecond update times, around 5 frames a second. And something special about this game, if uh, there's never more than 100 milliseconds between two frames in game time. Which basically means that because I'm getting 200 milliseconds per update, only 100 milliseconds game time is passing between those and the things are running at half speed. And you can verify that against the timer. So in that section at the end of the demo where it says I take like 5 hours doing the thing, yeah that actually took 10 hours to record. And there were many failed attempts which I had to throw away. God that took forever. Um, but so to start off, let's go leave this world for a demo world I prepared earlier. So the basic concept of this computer, and of any computer really, is sort of a transistor. Um, so our data lines in this case are connectors like this. If you haven't played the game before, you have these sources which output a signal, and receivers which can use it for something. And then you have all sorts of other mechanics here like this fan which needs something to activate it, in this case the switch, and then it'll lift whatever's in it up a bit. Um, let's just show off. This is the receiver, no signal comes from that, that's the source signal comes from it. So, in a transistor, this is basically one. If you turn one input on, it allows the other input to go to the output, but if it's off, no matter what this is, there's never going to be any output. So this is like the most fundamental unit in the entire computer, a cube with a, a fan with a cube on it. And we can combine these in many ways to make all sorts of different logic gates. So we put two in a row here. This is equivalent to an AND gate, which is a gate where the output does not turn on unless both of the inputs, which would be this switch and this switch, are also turned on. So nothing there, nothing there, but if they're both on, the output turns on. So in general an AND gate in this game just involves sending a signal between two of these cube fan units in a row. And then an OR gate is another similar one where the output turns on if either input is on. So that's these two switches as input. You see it turns on there, turns on there. An OR gate just involves connecting two things to a single connector. And in this case I have to block them just to make sure that I can toggle if it's on or off. Um, but then some fun stuff you can do if you add the third dimension. cube here and a cube here just to rise these connectors up a bit. Now my beam is going above the cubes and now I've suddenly inverted them. So if we only came out one cube then the signal is on unless the input is on when it turns off. So if you only have one input here this is a not gate or an inverter. With two inputs this becomes a nor gate where the output is only on if neither input is on. Either of these cubes rise and block the stream. And if we move a few more cubes around, oops. Uh, we need to be there. I am very prepared for this, as you can see. Move a few more cubes around like this, and ignore that. This here is a NAND gate, which is a gate that is on unless both inputs are on. Because again with that one, let's go on here, whoops. Okay, we've just inverted these things, so 
that can still go around there, the input's still on, but they're both on, now it turns off. Now it's on again. And with these basic logic gates, this is all you actually need to build a computer. Uh, that and a clock, but these receivers, they take time to activate. Now you don't really see it here because I've set it to 0.1 seconds, but it takes a bit of time to activate. And later on we'll see some receivers that take longer. So this design here is all nice and good and whatever, but it has one major problem. And that is that tubes and fans suck. They're terrible things, you should never use them. So these other things around here are these barriers, which if you activate them they turn on. And now note if you've actually played the game, most of the time you activate them to turn them off. But that's because if I go into the editor window here there's this auto activate option. And if it's automatically activated, then everything gets inverted. And I decided I'm not going to use any of the game's logic to make this computer, so auto-activate is off, I'm never going to use that as an inverter. And also under activators, you can see I can set two different things to activate this barrier. I've decided never to use that either, I'm not going to use the AND or the OR logic here. I'm only ever going to have one activator per barrier or fan. Um, but anyway, so, with these barriers, if I turn the signal on to block the beam, this is basically the exact same thing as when I have the signal travelling above the cubes. So right now this is a NOR gate, where if either of these inputs turns on, then the output turns on. It's only on if they're both on. And I don't have another barrier here, but you could see how that would make a NAND gate, and how just a single one is an inverter, and so on. Now barriers, they have the only disadvantage is that they only have on or off, there's no moving up or down. There's something else I could technically do, and I do use in one spot. Oh well I did, I think I've removed it now. It's something like this. Uh, let's get it close. Uh, actually this one's not going to be too useful, is it? It's not connect the as you can see this signal is on while, at this top signal is on while the beam is down while the cube is down, but when I activate this, now the bottom signal goes on and the top one turns off. I can't do that with barriers. And also technically I can rotate barriers, there's no way I can make like a vertical barrier with fans, because then the fans push the cube sideways and it falls, but I can do that with barriers. Um, I guess I haven't actually mentioned the point of barriers being good and cubes being bad though. So there are physics interactions between these two, which mean uh, I'm not going to be able to span this quickly enough. Uh, that's actually hard. Uh, basically if you activate this very quickly, Maybe if I turn force on a bit more. So it's kind of bouncing now, and hopefully this is going to work. Doesn't really seem to do anything. The point I'm trying to make is these things if they get short enough activation pulses, the cubes can bounce out. And then that's bad, because if you're 10 hours into recording a video and a cube bounces out of the way, suddenly you don't have a logic gate there anymore. See if I can manually push this out of the way a bit to simulate. No. Oh, we'll see this later. And the other reason is just, for some reason, barriers are a lot less laggy, it's insane. I haven't done a proper comparison, but I initially wanted to make the computer entirely out of cubes and fans, mostly because I just didn't think about uh, barriers. That had 370 millisecond update times. I've replaced a bunch of stuff with barriers now and I'm down to 200. Um, I'm actually sometimes even down to 175 if I'm um, in the right spot. It's insane how much less laggy barriers are.
I really should have designed it using just thin from the start. And so this is a basic overview here, and here I've put together some basic gates. So here's our just this is just a one tick delay. And this is something worth noting for later. All these receivers are set to 0.01 seconds. But if your frame rate is it'll always be at least one frame, so if I'm getting five frames a second, it's actually going to take a twentieth of a second or a tenth of a second game time to activate. Just because there's no way it can go in between frames. But movement from this cube, that does get smoothed out. So even though it might take 15 frames to go up there, if I'm only getting 10 frames a second, it'll still make that distance in two frames. Um, that'll be more relevant later. Uh, back to the gates, and here's the simple inverter I showed. Here we have our AND gate, and the NAND gate we're having two different cubes block things separately. I don't actually use this design much, I don't use this OR gate design much either. And here's an initial design for an XOR gate that you can see slow. So we turn one of them on, the oh, let me turn turbo off, the output here turns on, if I turn both on, uh, if I turn both on, it takes a second but it turns off. So I initially just manually made an XOR gate out of other gates, and this works pretty quickly. But I found a different design later, which I'll show off. And here are just the inverses, like the X, the X normally uses a NOR gate there rather than an OR gate, and a NAND rather than an AND. Pretty simple. And then back here, this is one of the most important parts of the system, and I've just noticed there's some Z fighting here, nice. This is an SR match, which is a system you can use to store data. Now they use two NAND or NOR gates, so let's just grab one of these real quick. Let's grab these. So the basic idea of a uh, of a SR latch is that you have a NAND gate. Right, just get rid of these clipping switches. You have a NAND or NOR gate, which gets one of the inputs from a different NAND or NOR gate, but the other from the other. And also, let me turn on this targets view so you can see how this works. So this, this will be on if neither of the inputs are on, which they aren't by default, so this will turn on. And then because one of these is on, this will turn off, which turns the span off and keeps it in a steady state. That's the idea at least. The problem is this happens in the game. See these cubes start bouncing, and this might actually be a way to show off what I wanted to earlier. Might get worse if I cap my frame rate. Right? There, you see, this cube got thrown off. They both got thrown off their fans. This is the thing I was meaning for that cubes just being terrible. Because now these are permanently turned on. In any case, if you have something like this in a steady state, these two are on, turning this fan on, blocking the surfaces off. But if I then turn this cube on, it'll block this, this will drop, that one will turn on, then this cube will rise, blocking it instead. And this is how you can store a, a single bit to value. You just decide, okay, this is our output. If this is on, our output is on. And whenever this input gets turned on, it turns off, and it stays like that until this input gets turned on and it turns back on. But, like you can see, there's this problem with the cubes bouncing. And for that, I added this extra fan here. 
This is an auto-activated fan. I did say I wasn't going to use any of the default logic, but I'm not using this for logic here. This is just so when the game loads, this fan is blocking the beam from here to here, which means that this won't activate for a split second while this rises. But by the time this has risen far enough, um, this thing will have activated and this will have risen to get in the way. So it always spawns in the steady state and after the first like 0 0.1 seconds this cube is completely irrelevant just because it's gotten it to that steady state. And now we can flick this to turn it on and flick that to turn it off like normal. And then here this is just a on a stable input. When I turn on, the output turns on briefly. I didn't really use this exact design, but I have one of these in the world somewhere. It turns on for a bit longer. Um, but so these are all the basic logic gate. And with these, you can start building the computer. Now, I don't want to go into too much detail about how it works. Uh, ben Eater has a brilliant tutorial series on making a breadboard 8-bit computer. And this works basically the same way. We have our logic gates now. We have how we're transmitting data, which is through connectors. You just need to hook everything up in the same sort of way that he did with electronics in his video series. I'll link that in the description because it's really an interesting watch. And I based a lot of this on that. Um, because this world here is so laggy, I didn't do most of the actual development in here, I just, this is where I connected stuff, so we'll go visit some of the individual worlds. So the first thing I made was this register. So a register is just something which can, I mean, it's basically just a small extension of this SR latch you can see here. Um, this is also something to note, I decided kind of arbitrarily. Blue is going to be for internal connections in the computer, red is going to be for inputs and outputs. So you can easily tell on this, okay, this is the set of input bits, this is the set of output bits, and this is a different input. It doesn't matter too much in the full PC, but it's just nice to see. Um, so what a register does, basically, is just you have an input value, and then when you turn this input signal on, it loads that value into the register, every bit gets its own... This is essentially the exact same thing, repeated 8 times for 8 bits. You can see this a lot. So each bit is loaded into its own SR latch, which then outputs. And so let's just put something random in here. You can see I connected these up to the inputs there. And then if I click the load, the output reflects that. 1, 0, 1... 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. If I turn this off, this doesn't change at all until I turn load back on when all the stuff drops again. Now, I did say barriers are basically NOR gates. Uh, single barriers are not switched like a single cube on a fan with a signal bucket is or not. So in practice, this here works great when I'm getting 120 FPS, but in practice in the 5 FPS world, sometimes these cubes drop in the wrong way and cause a tiny signal to get through to both at the same time and get stuck in the cycle again. So because cubes are physics based, they suck, I should never have used them. <laughs> uh, so in the actual world I replace these with barriers or Probably should have kept that world open because it's like 6 gigs. It'll take a second to load. Well, the world isn't, it's just a lot of RAM. Process memory 5 gigs. You can see this here is a register in the actual world. It looks a little different because the inputs are hooked up to connectors here, for example. And for outputs, I have a. Here the outputs are the same, but I have them going to connectors here and then through a barrier. Looks a little different, but the point is, the point I was trying to make is about these barriers here instead of cubes. They work the exact same way, but I had to swap them out for lag reasons. If we go check out targets, you can see this receiver just turns on all of these cubes here, 
and then here we have one inverted input and one regular input. And this one is risen up so that if load isn't on, it doesn't matter what the inverted is, it's never going to get through. Here, if it isn't on, regular is never going to get through to the inverse. Uh, I half wish I had left a single module of this out to the side, it would be a bit easier to see. But both of these are activated by this receiver here, so when this input bit is on, both of these will rise up. And it'll invert this, turning this signal off. Turn this signal on, which leads straight into the inputs of the SR latch, and then these two are hooked up to the outputs of each other. And this here is hooked up to the output too. I did say I never use two activators on a single thing, but I do have single receivers activating multiple things in places. Just because it's basically equivalent to if I put another delay module like this down and then just had a connector branching it off to two different receivers. It's no different really. Uh, so the register here, this is what you use to store that news. If I go back to the final PC, I have quite a lot of these. So here's the A register, this is the B register, this is the output register, which we use to store the output of mathematical operations. This is the high address register, I'll get to that later. Um, over here we have the instruction register, which stores the instruction the computer is currently performing. This is the RAM address register. And then here are three and a half registers as part of the RAM. So register holds a single value and ideally you just put 256 registers down, this is 256 bytes of RAM. And just if you have the right address in the RAM address register here, you deselect that. If this stores them based on the address this is storing, only one of the RAM registers would output. And ideally I'd have 256 of these, but it was just too laggy in this world, so I built four of these, and we'll go over this design a bit more later. But unfortunately I did have to resort to using a script here to deal with the other 252 bits of RAM, bytes of RAM, because it's just too laggy to do anything with. And the script is just nice too, because you can easily swap out the program here rather than having to manually reprogram different these different registers as part of the RAM. So if you want to write your own program, you just swap out this array and it works fine. Okay, next thing, let's go look at the adder. This is the adder I actually used in the world. As you can see, this is entirely barrier-based. Like I said, I used cubes at first. This is the first one I designed. And this is a bit of a mess. Um, let me go search up. So this here is a full adder. What it basically does, you have A and B input bits, and then a carrier bit, which we to later, and it adds together A and B, produces a sum output bit, as well as then grabbing the carrier bit and working out the next carry output bit. And this is all this here really does. It's eight of the same thing stacked again. But if we pop over to this side, you can see the carry bits are all aligned to each other. This is the carry output, it goes over here and then into this carry input. So the carry input from one full adder changes into the next one and so on. Um, but so if we go look at this design again, actually let's go back into this view from the top so you can kind of tell. This isn't the cleanest thing, but you have a nor okay. No, oh, that's an XOR gate, what am I talking about? XOR gate between A and B. The A input is over here, the B input is over here. Now the B input actually does something special, it jumps through this here, which... This was something I said to this here is my new improved NOR gate. Or rather it's an X NOR gate with an inverter on the end. 
because an XMOR gate is on if the input values are the same. See, it's currently on now because they're both at the bottom. To, to do this, it's just there's both a high connector and a low beam, and they both lead to the same output. So if one of these triggers, then both of the beams are blocked. If we swap them, both the beams are blocked again. If they're the same, one of the beams will be unblocked and you get output, which is then inverted to get a normal XOR. So the B input runs through an XOR gate here. We'll just... this is the input runs through these cubes as an XOR gate. You can ignore that for now. But then this is our B value, this is our A value. Oh boy, this is messy. They... I really wish it separated these into layers. Can I see better from below, maybe? Oh yeah, here it is. So the B and the A only come together on these into this XOR gate. That is the first XOR gate in the system. And then they also get to go into the output of this leads into this fan here as part of a second XOR gate, which combines with the carry input bit here to produce the summer output which is exactly how it works here. And then you have two AND gates leading into an OR gate for a carry output. And here's some of the special connector logic. Like I said earlier, two cubes at the same level in a row of a beam going through, and this is an AND gate. Both of these need to be activated for an output here. This here is also an AND gate. They both go to the same connector. So they're oaring the output of the two ANDs, just like is in the bottom of the circuit here. And, like I said, you then chain the carry that's into each individual thing and you get a full adder. Or 8 bits, let's go add... What would that be? Um, that's 5 plus, I don't know, 7? Which is 12. If we check the output bits here, that is off, that is off, this is on, that's 4, this is on 8, that's 12, off, 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 5 plus 7 is 12, it works. But now, there's this extra XOR gate I kind of glossed over that the B input goes through, and that's how you turn this into a subtractor instead of an adder. Um, so, traditionally, in binary, the most convenient way to store numbers is in the twos complement form. So in, if we go back here, if we're just talking about positive numbers, this is the ones bit, so this means one, one, this is twos, so one, two, that's three. This is fours, a one, a two, and a three, that's seven. So I block this, then it's just a one and a four, so that's fine, and so on. For negative numbers, in 2's complement, you invert the whole number and add 1. And very conveniently, this means that if you add the negative number to a positive number and just discard this upper carry bit, then what you get out is equal to what the negative and positive number added together actually are. So if I want to have 7 and subtract 5, Seven, five. Right now they're still adding, but that's all these XOR gates are for. If I move this cube out, all the XOR gates activate. Because an XOR is a conditional inverter. If this input is on, then no matter what the other value is, it will get inverted as its output. So you can see this fan is up because this cube is missing, but the output is off. The cube is here, so the output there is off, but here it's on, here it's off again, so that cube's missing, and the rest of them are all on, see? They're all zeros. It's just a conditional inverter here. To invert the number, to, if you're trying to subtract 5, this turns it into minus 5. Except for not quite, because you also need to add one, but that's what the carry bit is useful for. Because so there's nothing to carry into the first adder, but if you're subtracting something, you can tell it to carry one anyway to add one extra to the number. To properly do the twos component, twos complement conversion, and then you can just add them using the normal adder. And you can see now as output I get two. 
because all the rest of these are off, and 7 minus 5 is 2, it works. Um, but so I did say I remade this with barriers, the reason for this is somehow, twice in a row, after coming back from my 10 hour, well, waking up and seeing the 10 hour recording didn't work, twice in a row, this cube fell off. This exact cube at the exact same time in the video, which means that even if there's no actual input here, it would act as if there was an input. If say I'm trying to add 2 plus 4, let's go easy, 2 plus 4, right now it's giving 6. So you are on, you are on, rest it off. But because this bottom cube fell off, there's nothing to block this, it would actually give me 7 as an output. And it just ruined the whole thing. So, I was hoping that it was just like, free. The first time I hoped it was just like a freak chance and it wouldn't happen the second time, but it happened at the exact same time in the recording. Well, time range is like a good hour it could have happened in. The exact same cube fell off, ruining it in the exact same way in the same time range. So I said no and made this barrier based version instead. Show targets here too, this gets a tab, let see. I really wish I'd look into the modules of these out, have I said that before? So over here I just created a base. This is a single NOR gate module, two barriers, with a thing running through them, and I just still base this on the size of fans, like have everything else, it's just a nice grid to use. And this is entirely NOR and NOT gate based, so it's... Full adder NOR, this is how you make a full adder with only NOR gates. Um, this first section of five gates here, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one, that is the conditional inverter on the B input, so this is the B input, this is the A input, and here's our extra flag that makes that's the, the subtract flag which feeds into the carry bit as well as the conditional invert. And this is just how you make an, let's look for that, let's look that up to XOR from NOR, and I actually don't do that one, I do it's the one on Wikipedia, this one. So I just have this design here, built up here, in game, and this last one, it has two, in, two of the same input going into this NOR gate, that's just equivalent to an inverter. I don't actually need to put two barriers here, just one will do fine. If we come back here, this first set of four gates here, this form, this part of an XOR, but it's kind of clever and it reduces the gates it needs. So these four make that... Let's go view this top down so you can kind of see the things. So here's... I'm actually doing a bit of a clever thing here. This one barrier for the invert bit, it blocks for the XOR on this gate and this gate all the way up. So just saving a few entities, being a bit less laggy. But so yeah, these five are part of the XOR, which you can kind of see. This is invert plus B. No, this is invert plus B. This is invert plus output of this first one. This is B plus output of this first one, and then it's this one and this one into here, inverted here, which is what that other gate was. I'm not going to bring that up. And here we kind of make the start of the start of the outer there, and the carry segment is. It's kind of split up, but I believe there, 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 and there, except the carry. And then this last one is the carry output at the top there. And those probably make a lot more sense if I left individual modules with these. I haven't done this in a single world, I'll be annoyed every time. Um, so this works the exact same way. So if we do. 
five plus, you can notice it takes a lot longer to get started, but it doesn't matter. Because it'll always be done in time. We do five plus seven here, output gives us twelve, just like before. And I... Okay, I do not have a connector or anything here, so it's just... Manually look you have so we set the subtract bit and then do let's be different and subtract seven from eight and we get one as output it all works again, albeit slightly slower. Okay, what's next? Um let's just go down my list of worlds. Seven segment displays, okay let's do these. So this is the seven segment display you can see in the output in that final video. Um, if we actually check in here, these here are connected up to this bit of RAM. So these eight switches are actually how we can get user input into a program if you want it. The program I ran does not use it at all. So it's just kind of there, but if you wanted, you could write a program that uses it, because... Here we go, each one of those switches just starts one of these fans, then if the load bit is turned on, it'll output whatever is on those switches, which is pretty neat. Um, but the switches are irrelevant, basically. Here are the seven segment displays, and these... the four copies of the same thing, basically. And again, did not layer. But this is basically how you make a RAM in this game. Not a RAM, a ROM in this game. A read only memory. So I can't write anything here, but based on the input, the 7 segment displays will automatically hex the code. So if I put a 1 there in that bottom one, I now get a 1 on the output. If I put a 2, it becomes a 2. And I made this hex decode, so we now do a 10. This will display an A, and 11 would be a B and so on. B, and so on. And so this actually meant in the program I wrote that it converts a binary number into binary coded decimal in order to display it properly on these barriers, because they do hex decode. If I tried to store 48, it would be 3, 0, even though the actual output is 48, so it's hex. But so, as to how I did this, um, here, if I turn targets on, this kind of looks bad because they don't connect nicely, but each one of these connects to a certain bit of the display here. Just turn all these on so you can actually see them. So you have A, B, C, D, E, F, G. That's how they're normally ordered. And based on the inputs, you need to turn some of them on and off. Well, this is already well known how you do that. Here's the inputs I want, and here's what I need to turn on. Well, no, this is what I need to turn off. So. Remember that a NOR gate is just two cubes with a beam travelling above them? So it's very convenient to extend this to a free lane, or why you just move that out, not that far, move this out this way a bit. And it's a free lane OR gate suddenly. It is less convenient to extend out an OR gate. Uh, oh, that's actually a NAND. No, oh, that is a NOR, never mind. It's less convenient to extend out a two-way OR gate like this. So I ended up using NOR gates. This here is just one big NOR gate, as you can see. And so what this input is, it is the outputs here in bit. It says if the input is 0, 0, 0, 0, so 0, then the output should turn everything on except for G. Because remember, this is inverted, and that draws a zero. Because 
A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I wonder why all of these suddenly turned off. What did I do? <laughs> and just the... You can look up, I think the Wikipedia page for 7 sigma display will tell you these other values need to set to display these numbers. It's very easy. So what I did, you'll notice there's some extra special formatting here. I found this program called Espresso, which is very old, but what Espresso is, it's basically a multi-bit DNF solver. So if we were to only look at the first bit here, we could say this bit is set if the input is first input bit is 0, the second input bit is 0, the third input bit is 0, the fourth input bit is 1 like and all of those, or if the first input bit is 0 and the second is 1 and the third is 0 and the fourth is 0 or if the first is 1 and the second is 0 and the third is 1 and the fourth is 1 and so on Espresso What did I call this? Oh, for bit We'll take this input file and it works out an optimized multi-bit output for that because and here's an example that decides it doesn't matter if you're checking 0, 1, 1, 0 or if you're checking 1, 1, 1, 0 they both need to set bit 2 here and if we look in these uh, 1, 1, 0 here this needs bit 2 set and 0, 1, 1, 0 needs bit 2 set or rather not set really and it just optimizes this out so you can see I gave it 16 inputs but it came out with just 14 and so basically you, I, and if, if the inputs match this then I set this and you get everything that matches and all of them together um, so these two could match, you have 1, 1, 1, 0, these two could match at the same time, so you would get these two outputs and you do a logical XOR on them. I just realised it's probably a little small for you to see, but whatever. Don't know what it was at now, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> it's probably fine. So like I said, X uh, nors are easier to make than X nors, that's why I inverted all the inputs, all the outputs, but this structure here is basically exactly what Espresso output. I think these are in reverse order, this is 1, 0, 1, 0, yep, and this sets bit 3. And if you check this bottom one, it sets bit 3, or rather it blocks bit 3. It's the only distinction to make. Um, but so to do these input matches properly, I have your four input bits, and these just activate an entire row of fans each. But then for each case, if I want to check that the bit is on, I move the fan up one. So I have here I have a low fan cube where the beam is above them, but here the beam is low and immediately intersects. So the only way for this beam to get, go fully through to the end is if this turns on to move it out of the way, and if this turns on to move it out of the way, then the beam can go through and get out. If there's anything else, the beam will be blocked by something. Uh, whoops. And this is notably how you also just make a... This is just a comparison for a single value, how you do these. You have a NOR gate where you raise something. So the only way to get out but is if these two are on but none of the others are on. If that is the case, each receiver here activates all the fans in its row, which is just this one. You're yeah, blocking this one beam, meaning that here it is A. The bottom line there turns off. And for the bits it marked as dashes, which it doesn't care about, you just remove the fan. And now it doesn't matter if the fan is up or down, it'll go through anyway and it activates that row. This is how you make a ROM in this game. And you will see a bigger one later. <laughs> yeah, this here is a much bigger version of that I used as part of the decoder, which I'll speak about later.
Let's do this. This here is the logical part of the AL loop. So, I want to do your standard logical operations and or XOR and invert. And this is just a simple unit to do them. It's basically, I have two input bits here which map out which output you want because for the decoder it's simpler if I only need to have it output two different bits rather than four because you're never going to set both I want the OR output and I want the XOR output. You're only ever going to have one. So zero zero here means invert. So right now it's inverting the zero on the A input. But if I grab a few more, you can see, yep, that's properly inverted. And literally all it is is a... Where is it? Here it is. So this goes up, blocks, it's just an inverter. The invert bit is slightly more complicated though, because... All the others, and A and B, it doesn't matter if you add, if you have and A and B, or B and A. For invert, you only invert a single thing, so do you invert a or B, that's what this switch is. It's now inverting B, which is all on. Let's put this back, we're inverting A. So technically this uses three bits of input, but if I made this a three bit map, it'd just have extra cubes here for no reason, just putting a single extra input bit here, a single extra case. Um, but now if we go to 0, 1, this would be, I believe this is an AND. So nothing's on because none of these are both on, but if these two are both on, they have bitwise and. Uh, one zero would be a bitwise or, so if we block this one again, these three are on, it's a bitwise or, makes sense. And one one's a bitwise x or, which has these three on because they're all different, but if they're the same it turns off. It all works. This is, it's just the same thing stacked eight times like normal and it's Basically just each gate in a row, and then this same sort of ROM decoder, just as a demultiplexer to decide which one of the outputs it's going to enable. But there is one other major part of bitwise operations, which is over here. This is a bitwise shifter, and again it has a ROM here. Uh, what the ROM is doing in this case is basically just deciding how many outputs to turn on. And so how this works is just, you have a cube here that's either high or low. If the cube's high, then the signal passes beneath it, and so on. But if the cube ever turns low, which, let's go put like a 1 in, then this cube turns low, now that signal goes across and up instead, and this just shifts the signal. Now, if you were paying a bit of attention, you might have noticed this isn't actually in the actual PC. It's not doing it now, which is really annoying me. But this was incredibly stuttery when I first built it. I really wonder why it's not doing it anymore. It would have been so nice having access to these shift operations. Well, let's actually give it some input, maybe. That's what it needs. So we're inputting 5, but we're shifting it to 2, and you can see this just shifts these two on, but it shifts them up to, to those outputs. Well, you can kind of see it. This tiny thing here is already putting me down to 44 FPS. I mean, like, I'm pretty sure I used more cubes in the adder, and I like, still got like 120. So this is just extremely laggy for some reason, and I was getting even worse just sudden frame drops. So I ended up not being able to include shifters in my program, which, if you know the Colette's conjecture, is a divide by 2 by there, which is equal to a right shift 1. And I don't have a divide instruction either, so you'll probably be interested to see how I did that. I will get to that eventually. I say this is going to be a one hour video, probably more like two looking at the time now. But yeah, this is a shifter. It's a shame I couldn't use it, but it's way too laggy. It works off the same. Here's a ROM that turns... The ROM basically just turns different amounts of these on based on how many of these are on. 
So if you try to shift by 8 or more, it turns all of a wand. If you try to shift by 2, it only turns 2 on. It's just a demultiplexer again, basically. And if the stuff is on, it goes across, and if it's off, it goes up on, and it shifts. And if I just swapped U to point to here, and U to go across, or something like that, it would turn into a right shift instead of a left shift. Um, okay, RAM. Let's quickly look at this, because there's not much special here. This is just a single unit of RAM I made. And this is just made to copy-paste, and with how this is here, um, 8 units were costing... I believe 1 unit was costing 8 milliseconds update time each. So if we get out calculator, you get 2 seconds per frame just to handle 256 bytes of RAM, that's why I couldn't quite do all of it. Um, but so the clever thing to note here, it's probably better to show this off in the actual world, let's do that. So here you have the RAM address register, which stores the address in RAM we're currently looking up, and it outputs to this set of connectors here. And how this design would work is the top four of the bits of the RAM address would all just stop here, and they become part of this comparison here. In this case, we're comparing that all of the bits are on. If all of the bits are on, meaning the top four bits are equal to F, then it will turn on these two fans, allowing the top two signals through. And the top two signals are the load and output signals. So if the top four bits don't match, no signal ever goes these way, none of these registers can try to load a new value or output it. If they do match, then the signals do go through here, and then the bottom four bits are checked against each register. And here's the same AND formation again, check that these two are off, I believe these are the lower bits, yes they are, and these two are on. So if the lower bit here is in... Oh, the speed, it's a D. No, this is a B. No, C. I think it's a C, yeah. Yes, it's C, I... This checks that the bottom four bits are equal to C, and then this one checks that they're equal to D, E, F, and if they are equal, then it... Uh, then the signal gets here, and these two are controlled by the load and output things up here. So if load is on, it will this will rise in the signal that's reached this queue by successfully passing through the four. Can I get my bearings? The signal that reaches this connector by passing through these four cubes will be allowed underneath this, and it will activate this barrier, which is the load barrier. So here's one of the things again. You saw in the register this was 16 cubes and fans all stacked up. All connected to the same thing, but I can use a single barrier to be more efficient in terms of entities, plus barriers are just less laggy. This is how I got performance back. And the output works much the same way. So we have these things get activated if the output's on, and that lets the signal go past underneath, but this signal, this cube needs to be lifted up while there's a signal here in order for this to turn on to turn this barrier on, which will turn this barrier off and allow the signal out to the main bus. The main bus isn't something I've actually talked about yet. There's, if I go up high, you can see there's this line here. That's the main bus. Basically, every single component is just connected to the bus together, and they can turn their inputs and outputs off as they please. And if I need to send output from the adder into one of the registers, I turn the adder output on, it goes into the main bus, and I turn the register input on, and it takes that from the main bus, and that's how all the values get connected. So the main bus is right here, it's the closer series of lines you can see. So if output is enabled, output straight to the main bus. If input is enabled, the main bus goes... Well, it doesn't matter if input is enabled, the main bus always goes to these cubes here. 
but they had locked until the load thing was turned on. And in the case of this top bit, the byte hex ff is your user input, so load does nothing. You can't load anything into it. You can only the output, but if you tried a load command, it would just it would run properly, but it would do nothing because nothing matches. Well, if if matches, but your load signal is not going anywhere. Okay, so the last component to talk about is the clock. Oh no, it's not. Well, let's talk about the clock too, I guess. So, like I said, the in order to make a computer, you need logic gates and you need a form of clock, and this is that clock. You see this here turns on, it's currently set to one second every five seconds. And this is a special clock on that, it's holdable, so if I move this cube up, then this turns on and it'll never turn off again. Until you restart the map, so this is a nice and simple thing I can actually properly show off to turn targets on. Essentially all this is, is it's a delay gate hooked up to a not gate. So the not gate is on by default and it turns the delay gate on. So this goes up and then the delay gate is set to wait one second. This is, this is up, the delay gate waits a second, turns on, and then that turns this on, turning this off, which uh, turns the delay gate off and then this needs to go connect up again. It's probably easier to watch, so this connects up and it finishes, this rises up. And that connects, dropping this down. I know that turns on, rising this, meaning this breaks and drops that down. And so this this receiver here behind this cube controls how long the thing is on for, the pulse is on for, and then that plus this controls how often it happens. So it's on for that amount of time, off for that amount of time. In the actual computer, it's set to one second on, nine seconds off. But as you'll see soon, that doesn't how long it's on doesn't really matter for it. Just needs to be on for some period of time and periodically turn off. And to make it holdable, that's interesting. Um, we essentially have an SR latch again here. You see, this fan is on. It is controlled by this receiver here, which is on, so both of these are down. But if this receiver activates, then this will go up, blocking... If this receiver activates, this cube will go up, blocking this, so this will turn off and this will permanently be down, permanently forcing this to be activated and it never does anything. Um, and this here is just something to prevent a cycle, you can see if I... Move the cube to the side. Blah. And here's just an input. When this goes up, it blocks this beam, so this will go down. And even if this input then turns off, this cube will rise also and it'll block everything. So you can watch that carefully. This rises, this permanently goes down, it blocks the output of this, doesn't matter. This is never getting there again, and the clock permanently halts. Which is how you can stop the computer if you want to. So the clock is important because your computer has to do stuff in order. To do that I have this little thing here, it's a counter, and also the bigger version right over here. Oh, and the jump thing, that's sort of a separate word, we'll explain that later. The counter. Again, I've replaced various bits of this with barriers in the actual world, but this is a counter. Um, it has three inputs, it has the value here, let's go set this to, say, 6. And it has set override and clock. I think it calls load in some other places or whatever. So if I trigger clock, it just adds one at a time. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4. You just spent 10 minutes verifying this works for all 256. And it goes on. If set override is on, then when you clock, it'll load whatever the set value is into this. Um, I don't act. So this is for the program counter. 
The program counter stores what bit of the program the computer is currently executing. So it'll execute one instruction and then it needs to increment by one and execute the next instruction. So that's what clock is for. So currently executing instruction 6, we're finished. Clock. Okay, now we have the address of the next instruction to execute, so instruction 7. This extra set bit is for jump instructions. So if you wanted to jump to whatever this location is. You don't just want to have your computer have to toggle this like 50 times to get to the right place, you just want to load this value straight in. You can flip the set over and flip clock and it loads the value straight in. And then from there it will continue just like normal, adding one at a time. Right, so this works for a JK flip flop. And the target's there. So JK flip flop is. Oops, yeah, this is basically how it works. Uh, can I get a nicer picture? Here we go. So you essentially have a freeway AND gate leading into a normal SR latch from before. And the, S the AND gate gets output from a clock pulse. It gets input from a clock pulse from these J and K values and from the actual output of the thing. So clock pass is the first thing, that's what this bit down here does. When, if you look at these two cubes here, uh, those two, notice they only very briefly rise, even though I'm holding the clock down. If I just take this cube out, you'll see it keeps pulsing forever and it's actually counting up at a decent rate by itself. Probably could test it like this, in fact, but this is why you need a pulse detector in front of it, which shortens the clock pulse. Well. So here's that input, this is a single, it's two delay gates here, and then an inverter. Now I used to only have, I don't think I had a single delay gate, but due to the rounding in the position of the cube at low frame rates, a single delay gate just doesn't work, you need these two. But, so as you can see here, this fan turns on immediately when this input turns on. Then this fan turns on and like one or two frames later this turns on, one or two frames later this turns on. And when this turns on, this rises, one or two frames later this turns off. And this makes this cube fall and here we just have an AND gate. So if your input is on but the delay hasn't gotten to this NOT gate yet, then the AND gate will be on and all the cubes will rise. Once it reaches the AND gate, it'll force it off. The NOT gate, sorry. Once it reaches the NOT gate, the AND gate will be forced off until this turns off and on again. Which gives just a short enough pulse to make this tick up once without going into a full on loop. And then the J and K values are the other part of this. This is what the set override does. So you have these cubes here and the, these four cubes here are controlled at the set over. I don't know why this one is red, that should really be blue, but whatever. When you turn this on, this will turn this off and will cause these cubes to drop but these cubes to rise. Like so. Uh, these cubes here force both inputs on, and if you check like the truth table they have here, if both J and K are on when your input is on, then it will toggle the output. And if the input isn't rising or anything, it will just keep what it is, and if both inputs are zero, it will keep what it is. But if inputs are zero and one, but not both one, then it will change value. So that's what this bit does. This is the same as the load bit on a regular register. So essentially when this is on, this turns this into a load bit for... just This turns this whole thing into load logic for a regular register. When this is on, and then you clock. Loads whatever's in there. Zero in this case, but when it's off, both inputs are forced on, both J and K inputs. And this causes it to toggle. And then the toggles of each one are connected in series. Uh, the outputs of each one are connected to the... 
uh, yeah, to the enable things in series. So these will only go up. See, this cube is down until this one goes up. Well, other way around, but this signal is these cubes are down until this one turns on, and then we toggle it again. Both of these toggle, which means you which were off turn on, but you which were on turn off. And then there's a little bit of extra logic to make it not go too far. Um, starts up here, so this cube is triggered by this register, but all the following cubes are triggered by this value. So only if you're toggling this gate may it toggle the next one, and that just ensures it properly cycles. And yeah, I think that's what this image shows. Uh, this one, it's not quite right. Is this the one? Yes. So you can see the input of one forces the toggle of the others, and the output, if, if it's being toggled, and that goes into next one and so on. This is basically what I replicated. I don't, don't know why I'm explaining all this stuff. If you watch that Benny Eater tutorial series, which I'll probably put in the description, I mean, it's very long, it's probably longer than this video combined, but he probably explains it all much better than I do. Anyway, so here's the counter in action. A few things replaced with barriers again. And there's this curious extra bit here, which connects up to this. This is part of the jump flag, which it turns out it never built in a different world. I guess I didn't talk about the hydras register either. Oh, okay, here's the simplified counter. This is what the actual computer clock is. This counter does not have the ability to load values in it, it's just the two JK flip-flops hooked up to each other from our monostable pulse detector and the clock. So this will, every 10 seconds it will advance state once here, so this will turn first 0, 0, then 0, 1, then 1, 0, 1, 1. And this helps the decoder work out what to do. Anyway, back to the jump flag. So if you want to do a conditional branch, if you want to say branch if this value is zero or something like that, you need a jump flag. This is essentially just a one bit register. So here you can see one bit register here. And if this is set, it will allow you to jump. So the convenient thing is the clock input. Oh, by the way, I had to up the charge duration of the clock input to two just to make sure that the set input always turns on before this input does. There are a few things like that, I don't know if I'll remember them all. But anyway, essentially if the jump flag is set, then this cube will rise and it will allow the set input to turn on. And because you need to pulse the clock to set something anyway, it means if you're not allowed to turn the set input on, even if it says turn the input on but the jump flag isn't set so this cube is down, so the signal can't get through. Because you're clocking anyway, that means we'll just increment one. So you have your jump if zero instruction. If the jump flag is set, which you'd set it if if the value is currently zero, if the jump flag is set, it will allow the set program counter through and it will set it to whatever value the bus currently has. If it is not set, it's not the signal is not allowed through and just the clock signal goes through, which adds one and executes the next instruction. So basically, if the jump flag is set, you will jump when you do a set. If it's not set, you will only increment one. And you use this for these conditional branches. So I have two sets of inputs here. I'm trying to remember what way round these are. Why do I trigger these? Oh, this is... right, this is the load. Why do I do it like that? Oh, right, this is an OR. So if either of these inputs here are on, we activate the load into this register. And then each of these inputs activates a different form of input into this. 
So this here is set zero, it's just eight chained normals from each bit of the main bus. And so this is only going to be on if all of them are off. So if the value on the bus is zero, then all of these are on, and if you have the set zero thing on, this cube rises and it activates this, which stores a one into this register. The other one is a set negative, which just has a single cube active. Ugh. There's a single cube connected to this top bit, which is, if you're using two's complement, that defines negative numbers. So you can do something like... So you can compare if a value is negative, and use that to just branch things. Well, I don't actually use it in this, but it's easy enough to add. I mean, it's literally two cubes, so it's there anyway. Um, but then the jump flag goes into this inverter. Conditional inverter is just an XOR gate again before it actually comes to this blocking thing. Because I also wanted to have a branch not set instruction. I should say normally in like you know, normal x84 assembly you have multiple jump flags. I only have one jump flag because I'll get to it more later, but in my instruction set I had more space for set the jump flag instructions than I had space for branch if the jump flag is set instructions. So normally the set zero and set negative would go to two different flags, but here it's only one. And I wanted to have a branch if not set instruction as well as a branch if set. So I have a conditional inverter here which will Which will let you conditionally invert it if the branch flag is not set branch, rather than if it is. Okay, that's that. The last, uh, not really last because it's still the decoder, but the next component is the half address register here. Uh, high address register, not half address, but it is half a normal register as you can see. So if you go watch Ben Eater's tutorial breadboard computer series here, he makes an 8-bit computer. But in his instruction set, he decides four bits of every instruction are the instruction, and four bits are an immediate value. And that means he can only have 16 bits of RAM and 16 different instructions. And I'll talk more about how I got around that later, but I wanted more than 16 bytes of RAM. So that's where this high address register comes from. You can load four bits into this register, and they can be output to the four high bits of the main bus. Meaning, you can use one instruction to load the four high bits of your instruction into this register, and in the next instruction you can load from RAM, with four bits of your instruction going to the low bit, or low bits of the main bus goes into the address register and loads something from RAM. And if you only have 8-bit instructions, you can't properly index 8 bits of RAM using those instructions, it's just impossible. The absolute best you could do if you really wanted to design it like that is you could have, say, all instructions that start with a 0 are regular instructions, but if an instruction starts with a 1, then it's load from RAM at the address, whatever the next 7 bits are. So it's 128 bytes of RAM, but not 256. The only way to do 256 is with something like this that stores a bit of extra information about the address temporarily. And I also have this can output onto the bus as four low bits or four high bits. It's just that you you could do something like set the high address here just to four, load something from RAM, then increment it by one. So you load the high address register, add one to it, and store it back into the high address register. And it's it's a lot easier to do that if it outputs low values than if it outputs to these high bits. You need to add 16, which is awkward. More awkward than adding one at least. Okay, anyway, uh, ooh, so I never mentioned this. I've always found here just to rent it rendering extra stuff to stop a tiny bit of lag. And that's what sucks down to the 7 second display video. But finally, the decoder here. So we have the instruction just here, which stores your current instruction. And it outputs directly to the decoder. 
here is my decoder output. This is this isn't actually the output it gives because I made some mistakes in the initial input and had to change bits. Didn't want to massively rearrange it and and also just I made this easier for me to read because I mean you can see yeah that's not the easiest thing to read here. But this is what the decoder is set up like, and you can see it has 63 rows. I only have 60 instructions. And each instruction has four steps, as you can see in the step counter here. So there are 240 different stages I defined, but it only takes 63 comparisons to check. So this is why Espresso is so good for making ROMs. It massively compressed what this might have been, but it is still massive. This by itself eats something like a good 30 milliseconds. But this works the exact same as all the other ROMs we've seen, so each bit activates its entire row. You can see in a few places for we'll optimize stuff with barriers, because a barrier is just equal to an a barrier is equal to a not or an OR gate, so wherever there were low cubes like this. If there was a long streak of them, I could put a barrier in. And there's another one here, this is a long streak of check with zeros here. I could replace with a single entity. But I did more barrier replacing in this bit of the code because there are a lot longer streaks here and every single one of these cubes is low. So you feed your value in. Um, no, I'll explain that later. Feed your value in, it activates stuff here, blocking all sorts of things. And then it makes its way down here. As it turns out, while values change, the decoder just flickers and outputs all sorts of random values. So I had to add this extra step of receivers here, activating another set of fans, with a delay of two, just to make sure that none of those random. How did that get there? That is interesting. Okay. Well, it worked. I don't know, this might be in the file, if it is, whatever. Anyway, as I'm saying, as I was saying, all of these have a timer to two just to filter out this extra random outputs it gives. So the code only ever outputs the correct stuff, and then you can see you have labelled everything with text. This this line is the register A load. And then we follow this. Goes up here, goes across to here, to this one I think. And then across over here and pops down onto this receiver here, which is load on register A. So all of these outputs are to specifically define what outputs when, but all the outputs are then connected to one of these specific flags all around the map. And you can tell where they all are, because this is the one exception for the subtract, that everything has one of these red receivers facing up, coming from the top. And the decoder is really what makes the computer work, because without a decoder and a clock, I can say, okay, I'm going to activate register A output and register B input. And then I'm going to deactivate register B input and register A output, and that will store the value in A into B, but the decoder and the clock make the computer actually perform those steps in order. And so it's one of the most important bits, and also one of the most frustrating, <laughs> just because it was not well made. Something I probably should have done, even though, even though these have delays on them, if two things activate at the same time, it's still activate in the wrong order. I think there's one here too, somewhere. Yeah, so the RAM load, load into RAM, I guess RAM store I should say, flag, I was loading before the register output flags were loading, that was one of the bugs I had at one point. What I really should have done is add like an extra stage to the clock that would just have a big barrier blocking all of these until it reaches that bit in the clock. So everything outputs at once, and then I can just manually tweak stuff, but they didn't. I just had to spend a long time manually finding a few things to change the charge duration on, but I got it working in the end. 
So this actually reminds me of something I never quite explained. So I have the main bus, right? But for the ALU here, I have dedicated inputs from registers A and B. So this is the main bus, but here from register A, it's a dedicated input going straight into the ALU. And register B has a dedicated input going around the edge and activating them from the back. And this was one of the big things that allowed me to compress the thing now, because otherwise I would have to have register inside the ALU to store the value for A and for B, because I can't on the main bus put the value in A and the value in B at the same time. I have to store one of them and then it would just get messy, so dedicated lines it was. And this is also where the output register comes into play, because I can't have if I try to if I try to have the adder output into register A while the dedicated output in A is giving the adder input, it just starts looping and it gets weird and gives you weird outputs and back when this was cubes it would have cubes flying all over the place. It's just not good. You can't have a register input from its output during the same clock cycle. So the output register temporarily stores the output before loading it back into the proper registers. Probably should have said that a lot earlier. <laughs> I think at this point I've gone over the PC, or the components of the PC, so let's go talk about the instruction set. This one. So up into Windows. This here is the instruction set. In fact, this is all up on. Where's Firefox gone? This is all up on GitHub actually. I've put this whole repo up. You can read it here. But this is how I defined the instruction set. So I mentioned I wanted. I didn't want to limit myself to 16 instructions like Ben Eater had done in his computer. So what I came up with was this system of control bit. If bit 7 is set, then you have a 4-bit immediate in the instruction. And that is these four instructions here, uh, 8 instructions, they all have 4-bit immediates with 16 values. Otherwise, if that bit is 0 and bit 2 is set, and this has to be a bit that's not part of the original thing, just to give space, then it has a 2-bit immediate, and that's what these are, these are 2-bit or 4-value immediates. And if both of them are 0, then it doesn't have an immediate, and it's one of these boring instructions. And like that, this has space for 88 total instructions. And like I said, I used 60 of them. But it's still a decent instruction set for an 8-bit PC using one byte for its instruction. So if I were to use multiple bytes per instruction, that would just get really complicated and I definitely need a longer clock. Um, so something else neat that ended up happening, and the instruction set here was actually one of the first things I designed, so it's kind of intentional, but all of these 8-bit, 4-bit uh, immediate instructions involve memory addresses, and they all need to put that address onto the bus with the high address register. So here's the instruction register and here I have the outputs. So the bottom four bits can conditionally be output onto the main bus. And the two bit instructions they all have to do with the ALU. So they're not output onto the main bus, they just come over here and they replace the value of register B in the ALU. Which it does get a little confusing, it means you can't do like an add immediate one to register B, you can only do that add one to register A. But it was just easy. <laughs> um, I guess I can go through the instructions slightly. If you not put in a hole, not does nothing and just set that to zero to be easy. You have clear the value in A. Oh yeah, this is something else. That 6 is a pseudo control bit that normally defines the output register. Sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it does, but you can see here this clears the value in A. If bit 6 is set, it clears the value in B. 
to here, move A, this moves the value in B into A, move B moves the value in A into B. We have load and store register, which... Let me actually get these up. What would these be? These are control. No, these are data. Load register A and B. This is something I kind of made a mistake on, but... Load register A gets the address stored in register B and loads the value stored in memory at that address into register A. And B does the opposite. Ah, I should have made that it gets the address stored in register A and loads the value in memory into A, but I didn't, and it's a bit late to change now. Other instructions here, we have our for bitwise stuff, invert, and or xor. Here we have load and store high address, uh, load program counter and store program counter, also known as just register jump or jump. Um, add, subtract, no multiply or divide, they're hard to make. And then we have our conditional instructions. So compare and compare and test as well as check instructions. Let's go look those up. It's all up in GitHub if you want to get more information. Oh boy, what's it doing? There we go. <laughs> to compare, subtracts the value in register B from the value in register A, and sets the jump flag. This is what a compare does, it subtracts the values. A test performs a bitwise AND between the values. And then 0 sets it if the jump flag is 0, and negative sets it if bit 7 is set. So a compare negative you can use to do like a greater than. If, if B is greater than A, then when you do a compare negative, the result A minus B will be negative, this bit will be set, and the jump flag will be set. You can choose to jump then. And we also have these check, which just check on the value stored in a particular register. So check if A holds 0, and check if B holds 0, check if A is negative, check if B is negative. I had these opening on the wrong side, there we go. Now for our two-bit immediate instructions, we have add immediate, subtract immediate, check immediate, test immediate, uh, 0 and negative. And then AND or an XOR immediate, there's no invert immediate because there's no point there. And this is just our basic logical and arithmetic instructions, but you can do them with an immediate value. And the 4 bit immediates are a bit more interesting, as they're opening on the wrong side again. A branch if set, branch if not set like I said before. If the jump flag is set, changes the program counter to the address specified by the immediate and the value stored in the high address register. So we only have four bits to put here, but you can put four bits in the high address register to store the high high address bits. Jump immediate always does a jump, doesn't matter if the jump flag is set or not. Actually you can see it also sets the jump flag. So if it's not set, it will be set after this so that it can do the jump. High address immediate loads the immediate value into the high address register. This is a really useful instruction. And load immediate address loads register A with the value at an immediate address, which is address and the high address register address. Um, unfortunately, I only have space for eight of these instructions, so I wasn't able to do the load immediate address into B as well. You can only load the immediate address into A. But the two bit immediates only work with A anyway, so. The PSC just is biased towards register A, and you can make it work. The store immediate address is the same, it stores into RAM, and then we can also load immediates into each register. Which... It's nicer to do it like this than having to store the immediates in RAM, which you'll see when I get to discussing the program. So I defined all of these instructions, as you can see on the field here. And then I made this massive sheet where I just show what each instruction does, these are all the steps they have to do. 
So if we pick one random one like here, add A and B, we need to, on the first step, we need to have the adder output, because they're dedicated input lines, remember? So if the adder can just immediately output, then the output register needs to load that value, and then scroll across, nothing else happening. And then on the next step, we need to load the value on register A and output the value in the output register. So what A and B, what the adder output from adding A and B now gets stored into the into register A. It also immediately changes the adder, so it's of course why we need the output bit. And then also along the side, it clock, ups the clock by one in the program counter. So one thing I decided early on, which was it was a bit of a mistake, but it was needed, is that the last two steps of every instruction would be the exact same. That's why they're in grey here. They're always output program counter, load address in RAM, then load instruction register output the value in RAM at that address. So basically you just get whatever address the program counters at, you load the value at that address into the instruction register, then the clock resets and remember that the instruction register is hooked directly into the decoder. So when it loads the new value, the clock resets and then it decodes the next value. So it was important to define that always, no matter what the instruction is, these two would have the same value. Now, you see, this is how I did it. I said, no matter what the input is, if the clock is at 1, 0, we have this value. Oops. If the clock is at 1, 1, we have this value, no matter what the value is at all. And that is important because, theoretically, it doesn't seem to happen much. Probably mostly because all the things I load from RAM are done via the script here. But the different uh, where am I? But the different bits from RAM could be loaded on at different times. So you don't want the half an address, half an instruction to be loaded into the instruction register and that to suddenly change what it's decoding. You want it to always, even if it's an invalid instruction, like there's no instruction at hex free two, for example, but if it sees a hex, if it loads a hex free two, it will always, for those second two steps, do the same thing, which means while loading, the output doesn't change in the decoder. These two rows define this output. These back bits may change, but these two rows always force it to only output those same bits, which aren't blocked by anything else or anything else that could be active while these are active. So that was important to do. Um, but the reason this is a mistake is because the instruction register is set to zero by default. And that is a NOP. So it will execute the NOP first, and then load the next address, including upping the program counter by one. So to combat this, you'll notice everywhere I have, here's my output bit, and the auto-activated fan is on that bit. Auto-activated fan is on the output bit. Auto-activated fan is on the output bit. From the program counter, this is the output bit, but auto-activated fan is on the other one. The program counter needs to initialize to all ones, so that when the instruction register performs this initial not instruction, which shouldn't be there. When it ups by one, it goes, adds one, wraps around to zero, and then it, it properly fetches and executes the first instruction in your program. And the way I should have done this was just to standardize these two exact same instructions as the first two bits of every instruction. So when an instruction executes, the first thing it does is fetch what it actually is. But I didn't. I just needed that small hack and the slowest down by like two minutes every time you start. Well, if it executes that one extra knob, it doesn't have to. I <laughs> made testing so painful. Um, one thing I want to point out though is these jump instructions. Where are they? Let's do one of these. Well, just say, let's do that. So branch set does output high address, output to the main bus, the immediate value, and then set the program counter and clock the program counter. 
So when it's set, this means if, say, my busing unit and out high, just give me the value 0f. This means it loads 0f into the program counter, and then the next instruction it loads is the instruction at 0f. And on some systems, they still always add one that, like, have an extra 1 there, which adds one, then you know, 1, 0. And it loads the instruction after what you jump to, but no, because the clock loads to exactly the thing, there's no extra clock instruction here, it's a clock on basically everything else, but not here. It loads to exactly that address. And if the set is blocked, then this just acts as our clock. So if it can't set anything, then it doesn't matter that the user output, and it's basically just clocking, it'll add one and it'll go to the next instruction just fine. And the other thing for jump and the jump register, we, the first thing we do is just set zero on the jump flag without outputting anything else, because the default state of the main bus is zero. So this will always set the jump flag, and then we will properly be allowed to set the program counter. Technically we could do set negative and then invert output here, but less bits is easier on making the decoder. And I, I haven't tested it, but I got 63 lines like this. This sheet is just how I then converted this into the... I'm into the format for Espresso to deal with. You see here all the input bits concatenated together. Uh, this one I wrote manually, but then these two. And then here we just select everything. Swap the order so we can invert it here. And just select it if it's not empty. So this is the sheet I used to, to generate the input for Espresso to generate the format for the decoder, which I built. <laughs> okay. So that's the round about the computer design done and the round about the instruction set done. So let's talk about the program. Actually, let's quickly just talk about the extra tools in this repo. So Gelly Gally wrote me this simple simulator in Java. It does what it needs to, and this is what we use to verify that my program works. And then also later wrote this kind of simple Python program that just converts your converts a binary file back into a instruction file. And this is so we could verify that we converted the program properly. But here's the example program right here. This solves the Colette's conjecture and as you can see it's not that long. Well over here there's a lot of lookup tables. <laughs> but remember, I don't have a shift instruction, I don't have a times or divide. That's what makes this really hard. We need to divide by two without a shift or without a divide instruction. Oh, um, let me quickly get back to these two. So I manually wrote this by hand. There's no compiler or anything. I, I manually wrote uh, this. And then without a compiler or anything, I converted it to this set of hex, just by manually checking, and this is 256 bytes, and this is what's pasted into that script. This is what's pasted up here. So then we used another script just to convert this into an actual binary file here for Gelly's thing. And Gelly ran this program in his simulator and it worked. She worked first trying about me having to make any changes. It was really neat I wrote that, not being able to debug anything. And then I also, the disassembler can take either input and it converts this back into a file in this sort of format. It's very basic, so it won't have like these flags and uh, it'll like, instead of saying OX4, it'll say halt because that's what halt is. Or O is a halt. It doesn't detect variables from instructions or whatever, but it's enough to verify that the translation was correct. So yeah, basically we managed the translation, verified the translation was correct, and verified that it worked on the simulator. And then I spent about probably 80 hours AFKing overnight while I fixed things in between attempts. 
until it finally worked to get the attempt you saw in the video. But now let's actually go through this program. So this starts at address zero, this is the first thing that runs. This is this program is very clever. I, mean, I don't want to sound like I don't want to make it sound like I'm being egotistical or whatever, but I made this work so well, it's so clever. So the big thing to keep a track of is the high address. So I've marked every f boundary over here. So this is instruction zero f. This is instruction one f. So if I want to access anything here, I need to set the high address register to two over here, and you set it to one, and so on. And this whole thing fits with two bytes to spare, by the way. So over here at address ten, we store the character value we're working with. So hex three four. That's fifty two. I kind of arbitrarily picked 52, I initially had 76. Um, the way I'm doing the BCD conversion only works for two digits. I guess you might have guessed it's a lookup table, I didn't put a lookup for more digits, I don't have space. And a divide by 2 is already really hard. I would not want to try a divide by 10. Anyway, so value. Oh yeah, so the point was we can only convert two digits on the BCD, so I initially picked 76 because it gives it gives like the nicest colats injection sequence that doesn't go above 100. Technically there's something like 98 or whatever, maybe it was 92, which does have a higher value in it, but it just halves itself all the way down incredibly quickly and it's not that fun. 72 was a nice starting number except for it just took a bit too long to do, so I changed it over to 52. Oh, 76, not 72. It took too long to do. So I changed it over to 52, which... I mean, it was still 10 hours, but I can sleep for that. Started an hour before bed, have breakfast and shower for an hour after I wake up, easy. Uh, anyway, 52, then here's a temporary value to store the shifted value, which we're trying to divide by 2. Here's a mask value for dividing by 2, and then here's masks for bits 5 and 6. Uh, but first we do into register A, we load the value. We test if it is... is it... we test... Oof, 1. I don't know how you say this. You do a test if 0 on 1. So this overwrites the value of B. Test a B get zero, that is. So the value of A added with one. If that is zero, we set the the jump flag and we branch if set to address F even here. Our address is still zero. So we branch over here to zero F and we'll execute that later. If it is not zero, that means the lowest bit is set, but it's an odd number. Then this is simple, we move the value in A into B, so this is a copy, and then we add the two together, A plus A, and store it in A. I would let's say X instead, X plus X goes into A, then 2X in A plus X in B goes into A, so now we have 3X in A, so we just add a one more, add immediate AI, and now A stores 3X plus 1, that's what Colax does for odd numbers. We set high address to 3 and jump to 0, so 3 0 is where we finish converting and we convert it to BCD number, store it in the display and decide if to hold or not. But then just perfectly after that I managed to fit in all of my variables I wanted for this bit, as well as the one instruction to branch to to start even. Like, there's, there's no simpler way to do this, it just perfectly fits. Um, but remember the high address is still 0 here, even though we're now executing instructions at 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 3, and so on. So we move the value of A into B, then into A we load the value at 0C, which is mask, and we add them together, and store it in B. 
Sorry. My throat's getting dry, so I'm drinking a lot now. I've only been talking for almost two hours. So we just perform the mask on the value. And then we load it 6 or the address of R shift down here. At address 04, we have a lookup table, which is what? It's a 6 bit lookup for right shift 1, basically. So at 0, 0 right shift 1 is 0, 1 right shift 1 is 0, 2 right shift 1 is 1, 3 right shift 1 is 1, so on. If we check the final hex file, it starts at address 4, which would be over here. So this is our lookup table here. And it's just, you add to the address your value you want to try right shift 1, and you read out what that is to lookup table. Um, but so, I really wanted to put that at address 40 so that I could load the same value and not have to store an extra variable somewhere. And I guess I could put it at 3f too, but that's not as round of a number. And might as well give myself one byte extra space. So we load the value in the E, which is this address here, and then add the added value in B, the mask value we took out to that value to get our offset into the lookup table, store it in B, and then do a load register A to load into A the value in the lookup table at that address. We just looked up what the bottom six bits right shifted once are. I really wish I had more space because it's so easy just to use the lookup table, but I can't do 256 bytes of the lookup table. I could only fit in 6 bits, 64. And then the next step we need to... Sure, but then I assume my throat's getting super dry. <laughs> and the next bits we just manually check the remaining bits basically, so now... Uh, here at the end we store the shifted value into shifted because we need to replace our registers a bit. Um, we then load this bit 6 mask again, and move it into B, load the value, and we test if and together they are 0, so we test if bit 6 is set. And then we need to load a new high address, well this has been high address 0, now high address is 2, and if it is set, then we branch to skip bit 6, because it's 0, there's no bit there, meaning we don't need to add that bit into our shifted value. And that branches down to over here, which we'll get to later. Um, otherwise we load our high address back to 0. It's, I like, couldn't bring myself to... The speed is important here too. I could save like a byte if I move some of the stuff up above that, but I couldn't bring myself to do that and add like each instruction takes about 40 seconds to 4 steps, 10 second time, it's a little bit extra, let's say 50 seconds in game time per instruction, but we're running at just below half speed, so it's like 2 minutes per instruction. So to really, speed is the most important, so that's why I have an extra byte here just setting it back when I could have done this before I changed it in the first place. So anyway, if that bit is set, then we load our high address back, load this bit 5, move it into B, load our shifted value, or it, and store it back in the shifted. So we, we just add this extra bit into our shifted value if bit 6 is set, and that's bit 5 shifted down, and so we just shifted the 6th bit there. And then at this point we do need to change our high address anyway, because we could not store enough values here, you can see with bit 7 here is a different variable. So we load our new high address again, again. It's kind of wasting instructions, of wasting bytes, but in the case that this runs, it's quicker for the case that this does not run, which is most of the cases, that's what I should say. We load our new address, and then we just jump over this one variable byte, where we store our bit 7. Then. We load bit 7, 
and then we basically repeat the exact same thing, move it into B, then we load our value again from zero. And we, we had to load a 2 into the high address here in order to make this jump, there's no way around it. So we might as well put our extra value also in 2 as a high address. So bit 7 has 2 as a high address and we can load it with load immediate address score. Uh, we move it into B, then we set our high address back to 0, load the value, test it for 0, and do the same thing basically. Oh, I don't know why they're in this order, actually I should have moved this after, but we load the shift. Oh no, I know why they're like this, right? So we store... Yeah, actually, B register doesn't matter at this point. So we've tested if our normal value has bit 7 set, which none of them do, I know for a fact, because it never went above uh, 99. Let me turn to 127, but we do it anyway just to be consistent. You technically do this with something that goes above 99, it just wouldn't display properly. Um, so we test it, we set the jump flag, and then we just load our shifted value back, because the shifted value in register A is the new value that the next step is going to use, if it's not set. If it is set, then we need to add stuff to it, but if it's not set, then this already has our final value in it. And up here, we also left the odd section with the new value stored in register A. Finish assumes the new value is in register A. So we have to load this anyway, might as well load it in both cases. We load the new high address because we need the new high address to branch here. Branch there if we have to. Um, then if we don't, then we move the thing into B, load. You load meter, we load at an immediate address bit 62, which is over here. It's just another copy of bit 6 holding 40 so that we can OR that into A and it's OR in A and then we can execute finish like normal. The clever thing here is just to save bytes, like I said earlier, halt is equal to 40, so we use the halt instruction as the place where we load the 40 from, which saves one byte. And technically it doesn't matter because I have two bytes to spare, but it's good to save space and I just like reading out of instructions, reading values from instructions when possible. Self-modifying code is also fun, but I can fit that in here. Now in finish, we store whatever's in A back in the value field, and then we copy the value into B, load this BCD address, which is at hex 80. So we only had 60 bit look up, a 64 bit lookup for the right shift table. And the reason is because at address 80, we just have hex 0001012 over here, um, this. It's literally just in order a hex decoder list, so this would be address A, but it 0001 blah blah blah, this is 80 plus A, but we store address 10, so the hex decoder display is 10, and so on. This is how the hex decoder works, and this needed, this needed the fullest faces, why I couldn't put a 7-bit lookup table for the divide. So otherwise I'd have to do double dabble, which is very slow. And when we load this address, then we add our current value to it to get an offset into the lookup table, load that value, and set our high address to FD, which is the lower. Um, so address FF is your user input. Address FD controls these two bits of the register. So the high bit, the four bits of FD controls this seven segment display, the low four bits control this seven segment display. And address FE controls these two seven segment displays. So technically you could do three digit output, but I didn't want to write the code for that. So then again, this is the low four bits of address FE, and this is the high four bits of address FE. So you load into store this BCD converted value into the address FD to display it on the register. And let me do a compare if 0 or 1. 
if the value is exactly 1, which the binary value is 1, but the BCD converted value is also 1, so I can do this without having to reload the value, which is really smart. And then we, we, we compare that, and then we load address 0, 0. Because that's where the start of our loop is again, and this is made to continue working. I just realized I don't need this instruction, do I? Because so I am forced to load the high address to 0 before it runs there anyway. Oh well. Could have saved another byte. Big thing with this thing is though it's so tightly aligned. I can't add another instruction before this. If I add another instruction before this, then I need another instruction in order to jump to this, which is now be at one zero, well actually at one one then, and all sorts of these offsets get misaligned and I need to redo a lot of this. Even if I add just a single instruction at the front. So it might be the case that I'd have to add a knot at the front anyway if I remove that. It's interesting. I just realized though, sorry. Um, so if we compared and it was 1, that would set the thing. If it's not set, we loop and we do this all again. But if it is set, we go into the halt. And we're done. Um, we also just, because at the start, the first thing I do is calculate, we also just manually load into the low segment segment display the value 5 to. Because <laughs> I don't start with this. I could technically start with this, I guess, but again, it would mess up alignments to change now. So just to ensure that at the start it has the right value in the display, we just preload around with that address, because I'm allowed to preload around. And that's how it works. It's a really clever program that barely works, and dividing by 2 without having access to divide or right shift sucks. That's why if you notice in the speed up, the, I mean, you can see it's like 5 instructions to do the odd stuff, but 50 to do the, not 50, it's, we have like hex 3D instructions total, and be maybe 20, 30 instructions to divide by 2. So that's why you can see in the time lapse the odd things where it multiplies are always a lot quicker. But it's neat how this all worked and all aligned itself perfectly. Barely worked, two bytes to spare. Again, to show that off, here's where our lookup table for addresses starts. Here's the last bit we store. Just a, this is the bit 7, the mask we store as a variable in memory. Two bytes here to spare. Which is just really neat. I mean, technically, I could put stuff in here too. If you wanted to go above 100, maybe I could just set this to. That wouldn't be a great idea, setting that to 1. Theoretically, you could have these be the lower 100 thing and just say, yeah, you'll know when you're above 100. But I decided to leave these all at 0 for the rest of this lookup table. But yeah, that's how this PC works. A lot of logic. Very. Just a full 60 instruction instruction set. 8 bits. Has 256 bytes of RAM. It's just very slow. And so technically, it, you can prove it with a lot less. This should serve as a proper demonstration that the Talos principle is Turing complete.